Well, welcome to this episode of uh, Creator Chats. We're really excited to have you guys um, joining us today. Um, I've brought on the experts, actually, because this is a need that I've recognized um, a lot everywhere. My background is education. I'm Nicola Murphy, uh, head in microlearning at um, Nobi. And um, I've just been having so many conversations with, uh, with teachers, educators, uh, learners, about this this gap in engagement and effective uh, learning. Um, I don't know if you've come across those words before. You always see effective, engaging, high impact, um, gamification, and really this, I think it's, it's results from a need that we actually have to understand our learners better, uh, maybe understand their shifts in behavior over time. And we really wanted to just give you guys some practical tips and tricks um, to maybe adjust the way that we, you know, that you create, teach, train, and deliver content to make sure that's actually effective. So instead of me doing all the talking, I've actually brought in um, Corey, uh, Dr. Corey C. Miller, and I'm going to let you uh, explain your background a little bit, but we're so excited to have you um, on board today. Excellent. Well, I'm glad to be here. You know, I, my, I talked to a lot of different groups about, about particularly young people and, and young learners and Generation Z, and, you know, I, I love all the variety of that which I get to talk about, but there's something that's really special in my heart about learning. I'm an educator, I'm a professor. I spent prior to that 20 years working in colleges and universities as, a, as an administrator. So, you know, the idea of teaching and learning really kind of hits home with me. So um, I got my background actually in a higher education setting when it came to studying mm-hmm. Generation Z. I was, um, I was working at my university and we were in the process of recruiting for a four-year leadership program where students had to identify and apply into mm. the program prior to the, their first semester in college. So we had to capture them at a summer orientation program by having a booth and a couple information sessions. And um, I was working at a fairly large university, so we had so many orientations over and over. And so I kept seeing students coming in. Um, and this was, you know, I, we did this every single year. I started there in 2002. I've been, I'd done this, you know, for, dec- for over a decade. 2013 mm-hmm. came along, and wow, the students were just different. They oh, just asked such different questions. They came, they came huh. running over to the booth as opposed to maybe their parents dragging them over and trying to say, you know, leadership is really good. You know, they came over and were dragging their parents. And yeah. um, when they were actually apl- applying, they were filling out essay questions, and they were answering with mm-hmm. things that felt just different, right? No better or no worse, but, you know, why do you want to join this program? And it was, instead of develop my leadership skills, it was, I want to make a difference in my community. Um, Wow. You know, who do you hope to meet? Instead of saying just, I would like to meet some friends, you know, that we have something in common. It was, I want to find people that share my passions and values. I I noticed that it was such a difference that after so many orientations over and over and over this entire summer of 2013, I started to think that there was something to this. And mm. at the time, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what to call it. I didn't know what to attribute it to. I didn't even know if it was really anything or just me being hyper perceptive. Um, <laughs> so I started looking up online, like what's going, what is up with these college students today? Well, I mean, you get all sorts of weird things when you type that in. Um, and on the, but, on the <laughs> flip side of it, if I can add in, teachers who are really effective and content creators who are really effective 15 years ago are suddenly going, our feedback's changed. We're, we're, our content's the same. We're doing everything the same. Why? Why are my students not? You know, why are my learners not buying into what I'm doing anymore? So it's right. both ways. People are experiencing the difference. So please continue. It's interesting. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is, I, as soon as yeah. I started coming across what might be ex- explain this difference, which was a generational birth chart, and I learned about Generation Z, which oh. is the first time I'd heard of anything beyond millennials. Um, I started looking it up, looking up characteristics and realized that some of the things they were doing were really in alignment. And I went right back to my, my staff and I said, I don't know if this explains it, but all I know is that if we don't change what we're doing, they are not going to come. This is, you know, this is not if you build it, they will come. You have to make it in a way that's going to reach them. And so, um, so we ended up scrambling around trying to figure out what, what could we do in our program to align it better yeah. with the incoming students, regardless of what explained it. Um, yeah. But we yeah. did take the take the research that was out there. It was very early on research because these, you know, these people hadn't even come into really adulthood yet. They were 17, maybe mm-hmm. just turning 18. Took things that we could find from high school, you know, studies, adolescent studies, market research. I mean, and I wow. put together a two page handout. And I said, this is what we need to know about our students today. And a word got across campus, and I kind of, you know, yeah. did my, my campus tour to explain to academic advisors and anybody who will listen about how we need to change what we're doing. And 
from that point on, I, I launched a study the following year. I've now done five studies. I've written several mm-hmm. books. I've got two more books in the queue. Um, and I can look back, you know, here I am actually 10 years later. This is exactly the 10 year summer anniversary yeah. from that that happened. And, and while I can't 100% say that what I saw was a reflection of the generational shift, I, I can say that there was something enough going on that, that what I know now does help explain what I experienced in 2023. And I mean, in 2013, so 10 years, 10 years beforehand. And what was interesting is, you know, again, generational shifts don't just happen overnight. I mean, this was probably building, but there was something enough for me to say, wait a minute, these yeah. students are different and we yeah. need to adapt to who they are or they're not going to come. They're not going to retain. They're That's not right. going to be successful and they're not going to graduate. And I need to do my best to make sure that what we're doing supports them. So really that was kind of how I got my start. I love yeah. that. There's somebody just painting that need a little bit more. We we want to improve retention. We want to make sure they complete their content. We want to make sure that they actually learn. Exactly. <laughs> and we want to make sure that we still have a job, you know, because there's right. so many right. things out there for information places that they can go to. Um, just they're really innovative. If it doesn't work for them with you, then they'll find somewhere else to to get it. You know. So well, huge. that's the thing that I don't think people understand the reality of. If you look 20 yeah. years ago, 30 years ago. There weren't yep. a lot of alternatives to a traditional higher education path. Today, mm. there are. Um, you can get jobs without a college degree. You can yep. also do a lot of like MOOC, self-learning, DIY, micro-credentials, community college. You That's can do right. on-the-job training and get college credit for it where you never even have to step foot onto a campus. There are yep. so many other ways. And I don't know if people understand, at least at the college level, the dire call to all of us that, mm. that we need to be more in alignment with who we're trying to attract as our students if we want mm-hmm. them to come because they have choices that my generation didn't have the same kind of choices when I was younger. And so yeah. they, they just won't come or they won't That's come now. Yeah, I, I posed the question to you. I think it was last week, and I was kind of blown away. You know, Stanley University. I'm trying to attract students. This is just anecdotally. I've noticed across the board that student numbers in unis uh, and, and things like that seem to be dropping. I could be completely wrong, but that's just the word on the street that I've been hearing. Um, and I'm basically like, well, if they can get that content online, why do they come? Why come to a university? Why go through a degree at all? And you're like, they don't need to. The only thing that we <laughs> no. hold over them is, and you can fill in the blank. Right, just the, the it's currency it's of the crazy. diploma, but that's, I mean, yeah, at some point, it's, it's not its not necessarily worth it for some of them, especially because of the actual cost of it, mm. and mm-hmm. so, you know, I'm not trying to scare higher education and say, you know, we're never going to have college students, because that's not the reality, we're all, we're, probably, we're going to yeah. have college students, but really, do we want to maximize our own enrollment and our own success and our own mm-hmm. retention, because we also don't want to recruit a bunch of students who are not going to stay, that's and exactly. then, you know, so that's we don't want to set them up for for that. We don't want to set ourselves up for that in higher education. So, I mean, we have a moral Tell commitment. Tell us a bit about them then. Let's um let's get to know these guys. Are we cool, Gen Z? You know, but maybe attributed to many of us as learners as well. But let's get to know them a bit. What discoveries have you made? Well, I mean, this this generation. I've been studying them since they started coming to college. So, seventeen, eighteen yeah. years old. Now we're looking at them turning twenty seven, twenty eight years old. Right. So. They're still coming to college. We, when I first started studying them, we realized that this generation was fairly large. And so just mathematically, my co-collaborator, Megan Grace, and I, we kind of cut the generation in half and just said, okay, we're looking at the older half right now. We're calling them the big Zs. The big Zs are eventually going to get through college. <clears throat> we'll see the little Zs come along. What ended up happening is the ultimate like um, timeline that ended up breaking that for us, it, it, we, we didn't know at the time when we set this, was COVID. So, you know, your big Z's are your kind of pre-COVID Gen Z learners in college and your, your, you know, little Z's are sort of your COVID, post-COVID. And it just sort of worked out like that. And so when we did our studies, we did a study in 2014 and then we replicated the study in 2021 to see if there was any differences. And we did have some slight differences, but for the most part, we did see a lot of the same. But some of the things to know about this generation that may be different than, and I'm going to Contrast it mostly with millennials because that's the traditional age Love population it. that yeah. we had most recently. Um, you know, this generation particularly um, is motivated really differently. Um, mm. Actually, it's mo- motivated really differently than almost any generation that we've seen. Um, motivated by knowing that what they're going to be learning will make a difference for other people. Um, yeah. So this is really an interesting yeah. phenomenon because if you can explain why they're learning something and how it will practically help them be able to help yep. others, right? Yep. 
um, that is a real key. The things like whether you get extra credit or points or you get a deduction of a grade, those things, I mean, they matter to the extent that everybody's human and we, we want to not be penalized and we want to be rewarded, but it doesn't really stand out for this generation. They want to know that what they're doing is going to matter. Mm. Mm. Um, so that's really different. With millennials, they wanted to know that they were on the right track to achieving what the goal was. So that's I either true. learned it, I did it, I submitted it. I want to know I'm on the right track. Um, yeah. That's really different than even Gen Xers, if you go back, who are motivated by, you know, given autonomy and independence to show that I can do it on my own. Mm. Um, and so we have to be really mindful of understanding the motivations of why people are learning in the first place. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's that's key. And, and it's, the, you know, as I share some of these findings, these are these are themes. You know, we had large percentages of individuals over and over and other studies have pointed to the same thing that have mm-hmm. indicated certain themes, but not everyone ascribes to that. So no. the important thing is being able to figure out who your learners are and what motivates them, because and that's, that's the best way. If you're, if you're creating content and you're wanting to deliver it and you're wanting it to be effective, there was a, a famous teacher who talked about the difference between um, covering the content versus causing my students, my learners, to learn. If I'm going to cause them to learn, I've actually got to know who you are. Otherwise, you're creating something and you don't actually know how it's being digested or consumed. You're putting it out there and hoping that it'll be caught, but it's not actually being taught, so it doesn't actually result to change. So practical application and knowing I always think about the naughty student in the back of my room who's asking why (laughs) why are we doing this why are we learning this why am I spending my time in this room if I always have that in the back of my mind when I'm creating or teaching then I'm I'm better off but this is is really good sorry keep going yeah yeah no I mean I I totally agree with you is you know that being asked why is we need to make sure that we're we're saying that enough and talking about again Mm -hmm. The, the practical, not just the practical application, but one of the things that really resonates with Gen Z is that they're motivated by not letting other people down. And so, you know, framing something is not, not that this just has practical application in your, your future profession, but that yeah. not knowing this information or not having the skill to do it could be harmful or uh, might not make you the best professional you can be for the people that you're serving. If you're absent on the day that you learn how to use grading rubrics in your teacher education program, how effective of a teacher are you going to be? You're going to be missing that skill set. Are you going to let your students mm-hmm. down? And I'm not saying using it as a guilt, but I'm saying really explaining it as how it impacts other people, not just how it's applied. And I think that's wow. a differentiator that's really important to understand. Because we tended to be more linear, you know, keep on the path towards completion. But what you're saying is these guys are more they're more aware of how what they do is impacting on other people. So collaborative shared learning experiences become really important, don't they? Well, yeah, and understanding, again, the the, the meaning behind what it is that they're doing. And, and yep. you know, like with my leadership program, they wanted – those students wanted to be around other people that shared their passions. Mm. So being around other people, if they're going to collaborate, they want to be around people that they have similar passions, yep. values, goals. They're moving in the same direction. And we've actually found that um, a lot when it came to our studies. We found it corroborated the, over uh, three times in three different studies that talked about this notion of social learning, which is this idea huh. that learning around but not with others. So interpersonal learning is learning like in, in collaboration with. Um, social learning is just I'm sitting around you. I'm, social, I'm, I'm in a social setting with you. I'm studying, but I'm doing it independently. I can l- turn over to you and I can ask you a quick question. But they said, I, I love social learning. I, I think it's fun. I in, enjoy it a great deal. But I only want to be surrounded by people who are focused, dedicated, smart, mm. interested in the content. I do not want to be derailed. So, um, so that is really an important in terms in terms of their ability to um, kind of engage with other learners. Mm. So interesting. I remember on the, the world impact thing you were talking about earlier, we want to make, they want to make sure that what they're doing makes a difference. You were talking, I can't remember if it was this or in the TEDx talk that you beautifully gave, you were talking about volunteers. Do you remember that example? You talked about um, they, they won't necessarily sign up for being volunteers for something, but they, they're more kind of sitting back and thinking higher level than that. Do you, do you remember that? Right, right, yeah. I mean, well, their their goal really is to make social change. They want to yeah, it's address the root of the problem versus the symptom yeah. of the problem. And, and and so it's it's interesting because, you know, if you look back, particularly, you know, my background's in higher education. So you look back in higher education and we saw really, really big trends of service learning being integrated both in classrooms in college, but also in co-curricular programs. And even in, we saw, even in K-12, we saw more service learning, right? Um, mm. And service learning is, there, there's so many excellent things about service learning. 
but a lot of the ways that, that people end up deploying it is kind of a one-shot service day or one-shot service project. And what ends up happening, particularly with Gen Zers, is that um, some of them feel a little derailed by that. They say, well, this isn't the issue I'm passionate about. I don't have any long-term investment in this because I'm only going once, and we're not really addressing the problem. We're going and we're, we're fixing something that we'll have to come back out and fix in six more months. Um, what can I do to help alleviate or eradicate this problem to begin with? And so what's happening is we might be requiring service requirements, and then they're turning around and doing social change stuff on their own. So they're sort of duplicating the effort of that impact learning, the social impact learning that we want them to have. But I think maybe we need to revisit the ways in which service learning can be deployed. Um, I know sometimes it's deployed in a way where it's much more long term and there's, there's some social change mm -hmm. elements to it. Mm -hmm. I, I think if that's where our content creators are going, that's a good direction. Um, and if they're not, I think moving away from these one stop service projects um, yeah. for credit is, you know, and, and morphing them into something that has more depth and more impact, that's going to align more yeah. with Gen Z. And more options, I think, is what I'm hearing, too. You know, the, the concept of we would use this in education of student agency rather than just say a one way to, to accreditation or to learning or to the end goal, there's multiple ways of being able to get there because they, it sounds like you're saying they like to take more ownership of, they like to take more ownership of their learning. Um, so being able to facilitate that um, and give them different options to get there. Are you saying that too? It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's important because they like the flexibility and the choice. Yeah. Um, and so something with like a service learning would be good because you can help them figure out if there's a particular passion project that they want and, and then they can go towards that. Or maybe it's an organization yeah. they're already working with. Could they yeah. take it to the next level, right, and engage in yeah. more learning, that, that depth of learning, right, as opposed to some, like horizontal learning, you get some more vertical learning with them. That's going to be really important. I was talking to someone a couple of days ago who was mentioning, you know, I think it was his brother in this instance where he was like, yeah, I want to pursue higher education, <clears throat> but I'll do it over a period of 10 years. I want the credential, but I'm okay with doing courses, two courses at a time. And in the meantime, they've got this side hustle thing going on and they're owning yeah. their own house and they've got this business and they're super entrepreneurial. And we weren't like that. It was, you know, do all of the training unto the end goal. Here we go. But there are multiple ways to get there and they've got income there way more entrepreneurial than I think we, we grew up in. It's fascinating. Yeah, well, and that innovative mindset is just this, this way that, that yeah. you can solve problems from multiple angles. Yeah. I mean, it even translates into something as simple as, like when I think of like course yeah. readings, um, I think of, you know, the traditional, I mean, I still have some, mm -hmm. some classes that have a traditional book or something. I want them all to read the same thing. But then I might have for like, there's a particular class that I have that I say, here's like eight readings, pick one that resonates with you. I might also have a little yeah. TED talk on there or something else. I say, pick something that resonates with you. They all say the same thing. There's a lot mm -hmm. of people who have said a lot of good things. You pick your path because then you're going to be more engaged. And so I get to vet what it is that they're selecting from. But the idea of going back to this thing about choice yep. is really important. Okay. Let me play devil's advocate for a second. I'm a training company or I'm a higher education and I've got content. I'm, I'm aware that it's dry. But I just need you to do it. You just need to do it. So in light of what you've just said, how can I accommodate? It's something, we're not really just talking about Gen Z learners, but I think it's more because, I mean, I was, I probably classed myself as some of these elements growing up too, just in a very different kind of educational world. But how do I accommodate that knowing, well, I've got these things I've got to hit. They've got to know this information. They've, do you know what I mean? How do I make my content non-dry and accommodate these guys? Well, the, the first thing is you have to let it go. You have Ooh. to let go. I mean, <laughs> we have so many people say, well, I had to go through that. I had to read this right. book and take this test. So you have to do it too. And they're not as overt as that, but deep down they're thinking like I had to pay my dues. And so now you have to pay your dues too. We have to let that go. That's the first thing. And I think that's probably the hardest step for people. It's just to say, hardest step. I'm going to, I got to be done with that. The second thing is look at the I content and Sorry, how do, you, how do you get them to that point? Have you got any insight on that? Just that just awareness is the first thing, just calling them yeah. out on just saying, like, be aware. And then, you know, what is holding yeah. you back from this? Why are you holding on to this particular content? Uh, what is what benefit does it serve the students? What benefit does it serve you? you what, really kind of unpack that, I think. And mm -hmm. people people have to at the end, people have to make the choice to do that. You can't force that. But a lot yeah. of people don't even realize that they're holding on to old scripts. Um, I had yeah. a, a gentleman, an older gentleman in a, a, a presentation I was doing, and he said, so is reading dead? Should I never assign readings again because they're not going to read them? And I said, well, I'm not saying reading's dead. Reading is good. But 
Yeah. He's like, well, I had to read 600 pages a week for my college courses. And I said, well, how did that work for you? Was that good? Do you remember that Great. stuff? Yeah. And he, and he said, no, I don't remember any of it. And I said, then why would you want to do that to someone else? Oh, so good. So, and, so and good. I said, and, he, and I wasn't trying to like catch him or anything no. or make a mockery, but he, you know, he sort of invited yeah. this in and everybody just sort of gasped and they were like, you're right. Why are we doing this? And even he was like, wow, you're right. Reading isn't yeah. dead, but 600 pages a week might be too much just because I had to do it doesn't mean somebody else. Yeah. So I think being Love aware that. of the fact that there are different alternatives to get to something. The, um, mm. But I think the, the second part of that is once you realize mm. that you want to do something is really think creatively. Um, I have a class that I have required students to do. It's an organizational theory class, and I've asked them to analyze um, a case study of an organization. They're in a team of three. They analyze it, and then they identify what, you know, what might be going on in the organization, and then they have to make, like, a, um, a recommendation for to the CEO, the CEO, what maybe some things they could do to, you know, address the situation. It's very basic. I mean, it's because it's just a pretty thin case study, but – at the same mm. time, it helps them really kind of critically think and analyze and then, and then sort of apply some of their learning. The paper, I had them doing it as a paper for years, and they just were struggling so hard to articulate in a paper, mm-hmm. what in an academic paper, what that meant. And then I thought about it, and I thought, just because I had to do papers, an academic paper, doesn't necessarily mean that this is the best modality for this. Yeah. So I thought about it, and I thought, okay, if someone's going to do organizational development, they're likely not going to provide an academic paper to a CEO anyway. This isn't even real. Mm. So I let go of that. And mm. I ended up deciding that I was going to have them do a pitch and they get 15 minutes. And I told them, you get 15 minutes in front of the CEO, which is me, and they yep. have to pitch the problem. And we do it on, we did it on Zoom. I'm so, telling you, the quality of the learning was through the roof, 10 times better than it was in the paper. But I had to let go of my thought that this is a senior level class. They have to have an academic paper when in yep. reality they work 10 times harder to do this pitch and it was much yep. more realistic and the learning happened. And I, and so I think those two parts is letting it go and then realizing there is an alternative to the dry stuff. Yep. I promise you everything can be interesting and engaging and gamified or, or at least, at least yep. something that's diverse than, you know, and, and different than yep. what you're doing. So I, I, I don't that. agree that just because it, it, it yep. is dry, it has to be dry. I, I so agree. I, I've said, I said this because I, I train teachers, and um, one thing I'll say is sometimes that one well-worded question can derive more learning than half an hour of talking at them mm-hmm. because – you know what they what they knew versus the question that you're posing rubs against the old, the new, the I thought this is what this person had said versus what you're telling me, and then the rub happens, and that's where the learning goes, and then they they end up going and researching way more outside of the time mm-hmm. that you have with them to to discover those answers. So I love that that example of the project that you gave. I love it because they're pitching something, so it's adding to their own personal portfolio essentially. Mm-hmm. It's <clears throat> tied to something that's actually really really relevant, uh, just in time learning. Um, and they're gaining personal experience in it. So something, you know, essentially you could put that on your resume, like I've got experience mm-hmm. in this thing. It connects all the boxes. Mm-hmm. And um, it reverse engineers it a little. You're getting them to go and hunt for the information. And, and probably you'll probably cover like 20% and they go and find out 60% more just on their own time and add that. And it's a much learner, a, a much richer learning experience, isn't it? It's fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. But I, it all goes back to the heart of it is you have to look at what might – what might not be working the best that it could be and let it go and say, mm. you don't always have to throw out the entire assignment, but can you do something different? Can you try it so that you're not yeah. just the, with, I remember when I was going through teaching training a, a million years ago, I'm not that old, but it feels like a million years ago. <laughs> back in New Zealand, um, they would tell us great teaching is not being a dictator of information anymore because they can go and help the information themselves, but you're more of a facilitator. So you put yourself on the sideline. You're more of a, it was a, um, the guide on the side rather than the sage on the stage. Mm-hmm. And actually you're learning just as much as they are. And that mm-hmm. shared collaborative learning experience is way more motivating um, across the board. Um, it keeps it from being dry, mm-hmm. regardless of what the content is. I have students I'm teaching the art of learning to um, currently and, they will often, they think that the content's going to be super dry when they come and it's going to be learning theory and questions and constructive feedback and reflecting, how to reflect properly. And they go away from the class going, I'm really inspired. I don't even think I like the content. It's the way that you actually frame it, engage them, that, that makes a difference. And so good. Exactly. Can you, yeah. can you, I asked you a question, uh, was it last week? What have you been learning in the last six months? Do you remember what you answered to that? I, I would love, if you're willing, to share 
the the project and the research that you've been gathering and then maybe if you want to just a hint of what you were finding well in the last six months wow i've learned a whole lot we've finished yeah. up one study and started another study so <laughs> we have one that is uh generation z around the world um, it's a study a worldwide study of more than 30,000 gen zers in 82 countries around the world oh, which was, realize thousand that's amazing yeah, it was really, really big. It, it, it snowballed wow. into something really amazing. Um, so we had, it was actually 81 countries. It was 32 research teams uh, on the mm -hmm. ground all over the world, which was really, really neat. So that was one of the things. And the other one was uh, generations in the workplace. So I've been looking at comparing oh, generations okay. and their perspectives of, you know, how, how they show up in their workplace. So uh, if there's a particular one you want me to talk about, I could talk about either of them. I love them. They've, they've given me a lot of insight. Oh. I really wanted to, in the workplace, I think is fascinating for for our audience. Um, I think I love you to speak to that, but just a quick synopsis of the other one. Um, you were hoping to find differences in learners across those uh, countries, right? Right. Yes. We, we studied, we had researchers literally from the, each of these countries, 32 different countries from Botswana to Singapore to Ecuador to yeah. Belgium. And we were prepared to write a book about the differences between Gen Z all over the world. And we found that there were far more similarities than differences. And that was you know, mind to me. Yeah. And we ended up changing the nature of the book, right? We thought we ended up, you know, do looking at the generation, the generational cohort, like a global cohort. Who are they as a, as a worldwide entity? Now, granted, there were some, you know, obviously there's some differences regionally. There are some nuances, but interestingly, yeah. a lot of the things were very similar. Um, so Which that is, was, I just think it's fascinating. Okay. So let's flip to the, to the workplace. Cause there's something I don't actually know. Yeah. Well, we just finished up was our first study that we've done where we've done a comparative study with other generations. Um, my background is really looking at Gen Z most, mostly mm -hmm. selfishly because I was trying to figure out how to connect yep. with traditional age college students and that's who they were. Yep. But you know, now they're in the workforce and we're in the process of writing a book on the, uh, the guide to the gener to generations in the world of work. Um, and so we're, we're working on that right now and looking at some of the kind of nuances of, you know, kind of cultural shifts, sort of covid -y, post COVID kind of time. I mean, whatever this time is um, after the emergence of COVID, I would say, and looking mm. at elements of what do different generations maybe want. And, and we understand and we do preface that there's definitely a career life cycle effect, right? Older people, regardless of what generation they're in, are going to be looking towards retirement. You know, what they were 40 years ago, they were 60 years ago, they are now. But there are some nuances about some things that have carried with them through time that just mm -hmm. are, are unique about how they identify um, in terms of, you know, uh, things, everything from like professional development, what kinds of professional development that they're interested to, yeah. you know, how, how they learn. Um, you know, we're finding one of the, the changes that did happen from the pre-COVID studies to, studies to the post-COVID ones were that there's been a shift primarily with younger people, with Gen Zers, in um, moving away from the desire to have intrapersonal learning, which is like the self-learning, to more of a collaborative or interpersonal mm -hmm. or social learning. And, we, you know, we mm -hmm. think that that can probably be explained by the isolation effect that happened for many of them who were in the prime of their schooling during COVID, um, as opposed to other generations who weren't, right? They might have been in the workplace, but... Um, yep. So it's kind of like before COVID, people were like, yes, I love learning on my own. I want to take asynchronous classes. I like doing that. Yep. Now, not as, not as much. Um, and so the shift really there is it's not that there, there's not an interest in asynchronous, but this element of hybrid. Um, and that did emerge a little bit before COVID, too, is this idea of hybrid learning. But more, it's much mm -hmm. more pronounced now. It's saying there are things I can learn on my own. Do not call me back in person for a lecture. Like, don't, that's, that seems silly. Let me watch a recording. Yeah. Let me, you know, look something up myself or read something. Um, but what they do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what they want, they want is if they're going to be in person is they want that to matter. They mm -hmm. want there to be actual engagement. They want it to be activities, discussions, things that they wouldn't be able to have to that extent. Yeah. Asynchronous, asynchronously per, for one and maybe even synchronously online for another. But um, so we, mm. we are seeing a little bit of a difference in that. Um, you'll also see that, that, you know, folks like baby boomers were pretty, pretty excited for many of them to get back to the office, right? We've seen mm -hmm. that with the, mm -hmm. kind of the call for, 
you know, no more working from home thing and everybody else is sort of freaking out about it. And, you know, mm-hmm. older generations like well, we've, you know, we never worked from home before and we want to come back. And so there's a big, a big push pull there where you're seeing particularly um, younger generations saying, mm, no, I don't think so. So if they have the capacity or the ability or the financial safety net to leave a job that is doing something where it's kind of pulling them back in, in person, wow. full time for no reason, wow. um, a lot of them are saying, yeah, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm going to go wow. look for something else. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, really those mentalities come back, right? Because that's not mm-hmm. a career life cycle thing. It's not. I mean, it's it's we've never been in this situation before. It's not typically mm-hmm. that older people want to be back in person and younger people don't. Um, but it, it is creating um, kind of a residual effect and, you know, and things like learning and training and development. Again, if yep. you're going to pull me in for onboarding, right, in a learning situation, yep. make it worth my while if I'm going to be there in person. But but here's the thing. Um, Gen Zers really like social learning. So, you know, think about like an onboarding or a training situation where you might have them, you know, read or watch videos or do something, you know, reflective mm-hmm. or interactive and engaging on their own, right? Like modules yep. or something. But yep. invite them, not require them, but invite them to complete them in maybe a space with other employees who are doing the same thing or other learners who are doing the same thing. So they Amazing. can be around yeah. people if they want, but they don't, they're not required to be in that space. Yeah. Some will take them up on it and some will not, but that's, that's definitely a choice. Yep. So it's like, like we, go back nobody has that we've got a um, group wall. So you're, you're going through a course as a cohort together. You're learning and you're sharing your learnings with other people and there's a group wall and you can see everybody else's learnings on the same and comment and like things. So I think that's an example of what you talk about. That's really good. So interesting is it? I think it highlights also the reason for not going back to the office is we don't want the busy work. We all know what those meetings were like. And I think, mm-hmm. I mean, myself personally, I remember it was back-to-back meetings suddenly because we could, because we everybody mm-hmm. just got, discovered Zoom. And we realized, oh, maybe like 65% of these meetings is just send me an email. Why are we taking the time to sit here, you know, in person for an hour and go through the stuff? Um, and, and therefore, mm-hmm. we move back to person. Let's make sure it's meaningful as well. So it comes back to the point that you were talking about, like, it's really important to anticipate um, and ask that question, why? Why are we taking the time to have this meeting, to deliver this content, to produce this teaching? Um, exactly. So Could this it, not be replicated in yeah. you know, at 100% on in an online yeah. synchronous setting or even more so in an online asynchronous setting? What do we gain mm-hmm. and what do we lose by each of those things? And it's okay mm-hmm. to have in-person. I'm not against in-person. There's reasons for calling people together for unity and cohesion and all, all of those kinds of things. Yeah. But if you're pulling people together to just read a memo or to make announcements like that, a lot of people will really become disengaged. And likely then when you do call them together for a really purposeful reason are already disengaged because they're anticipating that that's just going to be a waste of time. And so it, it takes a lot more effort to say, what modality is this going to be most effective to appeal to people to be engaged? Yeah. You can force people to be somewhere, but you can't force them to care about being there. So uh, say I mean, that that's again. Gonna be, yeah, so you can force people to be somewhere, but you can't force them to care to be there, mm-hmm. right? So you might call everybody back into the office and they're sitting there and they're daydreaming and they're doing whatever it is, right? Or they're just going through the motions. But if you call yep. people back for a reason that matters to them, particularly Gen Z, where they want to know what they're doing matters, then mm-hmm. they're going to be engaged and they're going to get a whole lot more learning out of it. They're going to get a whole lot more you know, impact out of it. So we, we want to create scenarios where we're, we're allowing people to flourish, right? Like not just be in attendance. Love it. Very good. It's a difference between that. I often use this phrase. It's the difference between you want to convert them from being a passive consumer to an active contributor. Yeah, you know, exactly. Big difference in, in the philosophy of creating and um, in creating and um, teaching and delivering. I'm going to flip it for you just for a second. This is not a question you know is coming, but I'm, I was thinking about it this morning. If you could highlight gaps that our Gen Z learners have, that would be really, really great for our creators and teachers uh, if people who deliver content to know about, what would you say they would be? Here's, here's a couple that I've heard. I've heard that they are, they've got shorter attention spans is the classic one that we hear, right? That's why we see the words engaging, effective, impact around. Could you expand on that list? I've heard something about um, soft skills. They're coming back into the offices or into jobs and um, aren't actually particularly great at communicating or dealing with conflict or looking people right. in the eye. Um uh, I've heard oh, – I'll stop there for a second because I'm curious to know what you <laughs> – Right, right. Well, I mean, those are real things, right? Like the attention span is certainly a real thing. It's interesting, yeah. though, because while Gen Zers have pretty much 
that their attention span has been lower than probably, you know, other generations when they were their age, if you compared it. Other generations, older generations are also decreasing their attention spans, mm-hmm. you know, because we're in it, we're being pulled in so many directions, right? Where we're, you know, yeah. we're on our devices and we're, you know, we're trying yeah. to do a million things. Um, yeah. So that's one thing. So when we make content, and this is a pretty, pretty, you know, secure thing to say across all generations is, short and sweet snippets of mm-hmm. things is going to resonate with a lot of people, even though my, my attention span might've been longer when I was younger. Um, now yeah. here I am at this age, I still don't want to watch an hour long video. Like I just don't like, and so yeah. it's one of those things like, well, if I had to do it, you have to do it. No, nobody really wants to do that. Give yeah. me like a six minute video and a reflection, yeah. a handout, a worksheet, an interactive thing, a yeah. breakout, something. Um, I mean, I can't think of example as movies. If you look at movies back in the day, there were longer kind of longer sections before they were cut to a new scene. Now it's just like five seconds. It seems to be a new cut all the time going through to keep people's attention span going. Right? That's good. Yeah, yeah. So that's one thing. I mean, the other thing too is yeah. this idea of communication. Um, yep. You know, and I always say this with things like um, group work, group discussions, group assignments, whatever it might be, is that. Um, mm-hmm. Gen Zers, you know, generally like group work. Some of them don't. There's a lot of reasons, you know, we can get into later on about why that is. But um, one of the things that that a lot of them struggle with is creating that um, communication, collaboration, the ability to just even chit chat with people and having dialogue with people. They've spent um, kind of in the aggregate, they've spent less time in socializing or engaging with people in their mm. lifetimes than most other generations have by the time they were their age. And this was even pre-COVID just because of yep. technology and all sorts of yep. other things. But um, so we're talking about a generation that has less practice to be able to do those things. Um, and now we're putting them in a setting where we say, say we're in a synchronous setting online or we're even in an in-person setting and we're saying, okay, we turn to a partner and yeah. answer this yeah. question. The, the anxiety that that creates in people who, you wow. know, they haven't really grown up with a lot, you know, generally as a generation. I'm not talking about individuals. There's some individuals yeah. who are excellent at dialogue. But they haven't grown up specifically with a lot of that kind of interaction. It's like, what am I supposed to say to this person? Who is this person? And is that really the best learning environment when you have a sense of kind of anxiety and, and concern that what you're going to say might not sound good? You might come off like an imposter or you don't know enough. Um, yeah. And so yep. and then when we talk about group projects and group learning, it's like, well, what is my contribution going to be? What if someone who judges me for that? What if they don't think I'm good enough or smart enough? Mm-hmm. And so if we don't attend to that as educators and think about how do we create a safe space among learners? How do we help them do some basic communication skills? I, I mean, we shouldn't if people are going to say we shouldn't have to do that. They should have learned that in their, when they were younger. Well, some of them haven't. So if you want to come up with that notion and dig your heels in, fine, but your group projects and your dialogues are not going to be as rich. So take the time to talk about how you have a meaningful discussion, how you explore questions to their depth, how you create safe spaces, how you create um, expectations for working in a group, and literally spend the time having them learn how to do that so that when you ask them to do that, they have the skills and the confidence to be able to be effective in doing so. 100%, always address the needs first. I remember back in teaching days, it was like the first five weeks in the classroom were spent setting up routines, expectations, Mm -hmm. developing rapport with anybody and everybody. Why? Because they can't learn a darn thing, according to research, until those things are set. Uh, Based on point of orientation with the university um, a few years ago, and they had all of this information thrown at them, the usual kind of standard (laughs) handbooks, policies, all those kinds of things, detentions, suspensions. Um, And then they got to the end of the week, I had them, and I said, who can remember anything that they learned in the first week? Not a person raised their hand. Why are they still thinking, do I belong in a school? Have I got what it takes? All of those kind of things that you're Mm -hmm. talking about, how to address with. So we actually need to, it's not dumbing down our content, but it's actually scaffolding them beautifully so that they can actually receive the thing that we really need them to learn. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing is, you know, when we think about, I think about orientation, I mean, if it were me, my number one goal would be a sense of belonging. I don't Mm -hmm. care that they need to memorize where the health center is or what time the library is open. I need them to feel like they belong here and that it's a safe and affirming space for them and that they feel connected. I would spend probably more time doing connective activities for school pride, for getting to know other students, for those things. And and if I got around to mentioning when the library was open, fantastic. But, I mean, people know that there's a library on campus and you can give them like a little handbook and tell them all the different policies and all the different times things are open on a campus map. And I don't mean to 
you know, to be insulting, you know, in that sense that what we're, how we're approaching orientation isn't really effective. But the reality is, is with this generation, if they don't feel connected and they don't feel affirmed yeah. and belong, that they belong, that they don't want to be there. They're not going to go to the library because they're not going to go to college at all. And so it's, yeah. I mean, I, like I'm, I say this, it, it is kind of dire yeah. in some ways. Like we have got to rethink learning doesn't just happen in a classroom. Learning happens in all of these spaces, but learning has to be affirming at the same time. And on that too, I remember you saying it was like the, uh, students are not te- they're not choosing courses based on the content necessarily anymore. They're choosing it based on the the instructor. actual instructor yeah. um, and some of the teachers too. And I think that's a real encouragement for those because I'm always thinking, okay, how do we apply this to people who are creating content completely online and they're actually completely disconnected from the consumers who are going through? Like personalize your content to put yourself in it. So often as we as instructional mm-hmm. designers, we tend to hide behind our content. But actually, in the in the rise of AI and um, information is kind of taking a little bit more of a back seat because they can access it so quickly. But if your personality is actually present in the content and you're putting stuff forward and you're helping to facilitate, there's that feeling of being cared for, walked through an experience, I'm more likely to get buy-in. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, and it's interesting, too, because when I think about asynchronous content in particular, you know, there's like, I don't know where I've felt this undertone. It's definitely not been a directive, but I feel like in some sense that when we create things like maybe videos that they need to be so yep. generic that yeah. we're almost like just a robot spokesperson. And this can be picked right. up and used over and over and over with different kind of instructors who are tagged or assigned to this course. When in reality, it's like giving those personal experiences and telling those stories and letting them get to know you is really the richest part of the learning. And I think we abandon that to make it so universal. But in a sense, we're losing the connection that, you know, our our students get with us. Oh, so good. We could There's so many different learnings from what you've just last a little bit of time of thinking applicability and thinking about making the content making it matter personalizing it thinking about the why really knowing my audience not just gnc's but learners across the board because we all have elements of of this already um corey where can people find out more information about you if they want to uh well you can get a lot of great uh great resources including um links to podcasts I've been on and articles and books and all of those things in the, in the press and my TED Talk and things, you can go to com, and um, and so you can find it find it all there uh, we're constantly releasing new information like I said we have a book coming out January of 24 called Gen Z around the world another one slated for January of 25 called guides and Gen- to generations in the world of work uh, much Amazing. more just continuing to come come upon um, you know more and more resources and I just put them right up on that website Sounds great. And uh, what we actually do is we have a really new, unique way of doing podcasts at Nobi. We'll actually Nobify this interview. So if you want to dive a little deeper, I'll put those links uh, within that program uh, and people can go back, go through and learn a deeper dive in terms of this content and bits and pieces that you, you want to have thrown up there as well. Um, I have one final question from me actually from uh, someone in our audience who asked this question a couple of days ago. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic. I'm calling it an Ask the Expert and then we'll end with a, a word of wisdom from you. Um, <laughs> Um, but the, the Ask the Expert question would be this. So this person um, is actually, she founded a school um, 30 years, it has been kind of working on it for 30 years. Um, and she said, Gen Z, in her observations, is more interested in discovery rather than dogma. How can we effectively guide or inspire them towards the the dogma, I guess is what she's asking. Hmm. Interesting question. Yeah, you know, I I kind of kind of philosophically kind of stepping back from that question a little bit is I'm not sure that we need to inspire them. Hmm. Um, I'm what I think we need to do is make room for the things that matter to them and help them understand all of the pieces of that, whether that's the dogma, the practicality, the, the connection points. Uh, and, and I think a lot of them are coming to us inspired. And I, I worry that we might be doing things to uninspire them <laughs> with that unintentionally. And hmm. so what can we do is help them figure out what those passions are and then help them get connected to, to all the different resources and ways about exploring that passion. And I think that's the, the key to what we need to be doing, not just in, her, in this person's situation, but also in the situation of just generally, you know, um, some students do come to classes or experiences like I'm not inspired by mm-hmm. math and I've got to take this math class, mm-hmm. but finding something within the content, helping them discover what in that content might mm-hmm. be inspiring to them because there's mm-hmm. something that speaks to everybody and everything. They're just, mm-hmm. you can find it. And our job yeah. as educators is to help them connect with our content and find it. And for some, it's going to be a lot easier than others, 
But then mm-hmm. once they find that passion, let them go with it. They will be inspired themselves. Yeah, and I think on that too, just yeah, I think that's it's really good. It's like we can bring the correction, like facilitate the experience, but then bring the correction points where you see them kind of going off the learning path down towards something you didn't intend for them to learn. <laughs> right, so. right. And sometimes what they what you didn't intend for them to learn is a learning experience for us, and we're like, wow, that's I'm going to incorporate that in the future. Or sometimes it's just completely off the rails, or it's misinformation, and we help bring them back in and tie them back into what is that inspiration point for them, and get them back kind of into kind of more fact based or, or more reality based experiences. So good, Corey. Okay, final word of wisdom from you. What would it be? Throw you on the spot here. My final word of wisdom is going to be, let it let it go. I think I really resonate with that idea. Just (laughs) let it go of the way that we've been doing things. If they're working and they're awesome, keep them. But Mm. if they're not, don't be afraid to let it go. And it might Mm. be completely against everything that you know. Like, we've always done a paper. We've always done tests. We've always done learning modules, whatever it is. Let it go and just sit with it for a minute and say, how would people learn this? And the other thing, too, is... In some sense, you know, the golden rule is this idea of treat others how you want to be treated. Sometimes the way we want to learn is not the way our learners want to learn. So exactly let right. that go too, right? Mm. Like I really maybe enjoy reading, but I don't know that my learners do. So think about what can I let go of that's my own bias, my own lens, my own expectation for my own history, mm-hmm. for my own preference, and let it go, learn who my learners are, and redesign things with choice, right, with, with a broad spectrum of choice and be able to tap into what it is that they're going to excel at and they're going to enjoy. You heard it here from Dr. Corey C. Miller. That's a fantastic way to wrap up. And there'll be creative chats in this episode. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you next time. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>